Hey, welcome to the last message in this You're Not Far series. We've been looking at Luke chapter 24 and this amazing moment between two of Jesus' followers and Jesus where their hearts began to burn. So wherever you're joining us from, whether you're online or at one of our gatherings, you are so welcome. John Shaughnessy was one of the great football players in Pennsylvania football history. Back in 1964, he rushed for 1,290 yards and 21 touchdowns in just seven games at Oil City High. He went on to play for Arizona State and even tried out for a pro team or two. But, but most don't know that Jim grew up in a, a pretty abusive home. As a kid, his father would start with his brother and then Jim and then their mother. And one by one, he would beat them. Jim said, my blood often painted our kitchen walls. Just imagine what that did to his young heart. Jim grew up angry and he played football angry. When he let his rage loose on the field, it almost seemed like no one could stop him. But the rage that made him unstoppable was also twisting up his heart. Then in his junior year at Arizona State University, Jim came face to face with Jesus. And, and before I share more of his story, let, let me just put this in Emmaus Road burning heart language. Nothing Nothing, nothing is more important than coming face to face with Jesus. Nothing is more important than recognizing Jesus. Every Saturday night after a football game, Jim went into the bars and any guy that even looked at a woman wrong, he would beat senseless. But then he had this head-on collision with Christ and he was challenged to give his heart to Jesus and something inside of him rose to the challenge. He surrendered to Jesus and overnight, Jimmy said, Jesus made my heart new. He had a new heart. But to be honest, he didn't have much hope for his dad. He was far from hope. But there was a man named Gary Smollett, you may have heard of him, who challenged Jimmy to reconcile with his dad. Jimmy said, I could never do that. And Gary said, Jim, do you have any responsibility for what went bad in that relationship? And, and Jim said, I don't know, maybe 3%. Gary said, Jimmy, you need to take 100% responsibility for your 3%. Jimmy was convicted by that, and so he went home. Pennsylvania home, walked his dad out to a field in back of the house and said, Daddy, I, I want to ask your forgiveness. Daddy, I put you up on a pedestal that no man could fulfill. I compared you to my coaches. I compared you to my girlfriend's fathers. Daddy, I want to ask you to forgive me, and I want to tell you that I forgive you. His dad wouldn't even listen. He rebuked him. He insulted him. He, he spit on his heart and drained his hope. And, and Jimmy just began to weep there in that field, and he looked up into the sky and said, God, I don't know what to do anymore. All I hope is that someday my daddy will get to know you as father, just like I've gotten to know you as father. See, when our eyes are opened and we recognize Jesus in our midst, our hearts begin to burn. It's like no hope is too large to hope. <laughs> when Jimmy recognized Jesus in his life, he began to believe that God could even help his father see Jesus. He, he, he his head hoped. <laughs> was now turned to fresh hope. He looked down after he prayed and, and his dad, he was crying his eyes out. He had never seen his dad cry in his life. His dad's heart was broken by the humility of Jim's heart and the power of God. His daddy said, Jimbo, I've never heard anyone talk to God like that. His dad looked up into the heavens and he said, God, if I could ever get to know you like Jimmy does, please let me get to know you like that. And he gave his heart to Jesus in that Pennsylvania field out behind their house, changed their relationship. Why? Because he saw Jesus. 
He recognized Jesus and Jimmy. His eyes were opened. He recognized Christ in the, in the grace and forgiveness of his son, the love and the intimate, authentic, broken prayer of his son. He, he recognized Jesus. And, and that's where it all begins, on every far road away. <laughs> on a far road away, we're kept from recognizing Jesus. You, you know Luke 24. I, you know, I was thinking about this, and And we can talk about all the trouble in our world today, and there's plenty of it. We can talk about how people's hearts seem hardened today, and they are, how culture is against us, how we feel like this school or that group is squeezing our influence out the door. We can talk about living in a post-Christian world that has a negative view of the church, but in the end, everything changes. I'm telling you, everything changes when people recognize Jesus in us. And you know what, if not much is changing, Maybe it's because our hearts aren't burning. Maybe people don't recognize Jesus in us. Recognizing Jesus was at the heart of the Emmaus Road all those years ago. Let let me read again Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 16. It says, Now that same day two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. They were, they were kept from recognizing him. They, they didn't see, they didn't know how close they were to the resurrected Christ. They, they didn't recognize that the healer of hearts, the giver of hope, the king of the kingdom, and the savior of the world, they, they didn't know that the defeater of death was walking with them on their seemingly hopeless journey. They, they didn't know how close they were, how not far they were. They didn't know and... And when we don't know, we, we describe our life with words like, we had hoped, but now we're far. We had joy, but, but now we're far. Maybe even words like, once upon a time, we were with Jesus, but now we're far. You know, I've come across so many conversations lately in just the last few weeks, the last few days, too many stories that, that contain those words. Once upon a time, I was with Jesus. My heart burned. I, I experienced his presence. I recognized him. But now I just feel so far. So how do we come near? It's not rocket science, but it's also not negotiable either. We will not come near to Christ without the word of God. The word brings us near. Uh, John Ortberg shares uh, one of my favorite stories about some friends in the Midwest. From an outside look, they had it all together. Successful lawyer, gorgeous house for a stay-at-home mom. Her name was Eileen, but her soul was slowly starving, and her husband was an alcoholic. Well, one day, a neighbor, front yard mission, right, invited their daughter to a gathering in their home. They called it a backyard Bible club. When her daughter came home, she found out that the people at the club had told her daughter about Jesus, which really kind of bothered Eileen. She wasn't into religion. Frankly, she was upset that it happened at all, but her daughter just couldn't stop talking about Jesus. Eileen couldn't sleep that night. She got up about midnight. She opened a drawer to find a Bible that had never been read. She she saw that it had an Old Testament and a New Testament. She had no idea what that even meant, but she figured the New Testament must be the upgraded version, so she started there. She read Matthew and Mark and Luke and she finished the Gospel of John at three in the morning and in her own words, I just fell in love with this man Jesus and what the disciples are doing, I want to do. Not soon after that, her husband's law firm made him go to AA and through someone at AA, he met Jesus and, and God gave him the power to quit drinking. All because she discovered Jesus. She was pointed to Jesus in the Word of God. See, this is the glorious goal of Scripture. The the Word points us to, it brings us to Jesus. I mean, isn't this what Jesus was saying in the hours after his resurrection as he walked that road before they even knew about resurrection? Jesus is walking on this road to Emmaus with these two friends, these two followers. They don't recognize him, but after they pour out their story, we see in Luke 24, verses 25 through 27, Jesus said to them, How foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Do you understand? All of scripture tells his story. All of scripture tells 
the story of Jesus, the writings of Moses and the prophets, later talking to the rest of the disciples, Jesus will include the Psalms, Moses, the prophet, the Psalms. It all points to the amazing story of Jesus. Do you remember the movie, The Sixth Sense? It was the movie that everybody wanted to see a second time, but nobody would watch a third time, right? The, the first time you watch the movie, you get to the end, and it's like, oh my goodness, I missed it. I, I watched the whole movie, and I missed it. The, the movie is about a, a little boy who's meeting with a psychologist, and the little boy's problem is he sees dead people. Spoiler alert, you get to the end of the movie, and you find out that Bruce Willis, the psychologist, is one of the dead people that the little boy is referring to when he says, I see dead people. I mean, the whole movie, the whole time Bruce Willis was dead and, and you missed it the first time through. But then when you discover that he's one of the dead people, that news changes everything. It changes the whole story. When you watch it the second time, every scene is transformed by that news. There's Bruce Willis and a woman talking the first time through. You couldn't understand why she wouldn't look at him. And now you realize she couldn't see him. He's dead. You can't watch the second time without seeing the story in light of this news. It changes everything. Well, Jesus is the news that changes everything in Scripture. He's the missing piece of information that transforms the Word of God. Don't read the story of Jonah in the belly of a well for three days, three days, without having an I see dead people moment. It's like, wait a minute, three days in the belly. Oh my goodness, it's pointing to Jesus. Rahab's scarlet cord of salvation in the book of Joshua, Esther's willingness to die for her people. How often do we need to read in the book of Leviticus that life is in the blood of the sacrifice? Isaiah's suffering servant, Jesus, he's all over the place. But, but that's not all, right? It's not, it's not just finding out about Jesus that draws us to the word. We're actually drawn to Christ himself by the word. If you know anything about the spiritual culture, the history of the Jewish people in the time of Jesus, you, you know that they were a people of the book. They honored and rever revered the, the Torah. Their, their culture and their community revolved around the book, the scrolls of, of God. And, and this reference for Scripture shaped the life of the early church, too. I love the story that Rock Bottomley shares. I know, how could you name your kid Rock Bottomley? I mean, can you imagine all the kids in middle school who just wanted to be able to say, yep, I hit Rock Bottomley today. Anyway, Rock tells a story of visiting Israel and sitting beside the Sea of Galilee while their guide reenacted a typical early Christian worship service. When they came to the part of the service during which people listened to the reading of the Bible, the words of God, their teacher walked to the ancient ruins of a closet where the sacred scrolls of the Torah had been stored, and he took out an imaginary scroll, and as the people clapped in unison, he began to dance the Torah dance. While he was weaving his way through the congregation, the people imitated the early church worshipers by putting their, their hands to their lips and then touching the sacred scroll as he passed by there thereby kissing the sacred words of God. And as the teacher made his way back to the front, everyone would stand. And then he would read the words of Scripture. And when he was done reading, he would declare, these are the very words of God. Rock writes, this is why they clapped with excitement. This is why they kissed the scroll. This is why the reader danced. This is why they stood in hushed silence while the scriptures were read. This is why they listened with eager anticipation because God was about to visit them. They were a people of the book. And I say all of this to simply set the context for John's words in, in John's gospel in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, when, when John writes, in the beginning, the word already existed. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God, and God created everything through Him, the Word of God, and nothing was created except through Him. The Word gave life to everything that was created, and His life brought light to everyone. The Word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path, the psalmist wrote. It's active and alive, Paul wrote. It, it sets the lines and it shapes our hearts, but but, but there's more because it's not just a book. John tells us that the Word became flesh and lived in our midst, the glorious Son of God. In other words, the Word of God is the Son of God. <laughs> there's some kind of connection that goes beyond metaphor into the land of mystical, a connection between Jesus who is called the Word and the Word which we call 
our Bible, it's almost like God speaks and every time he opens his mouth, Jesus comes out. See, you can't love Jesus if we don't love the word. It, it's not just about a book, it's about a person. We're not just finding the truth, we're finding the one who is true. We're not just discovering the way to live, we're discovering the author of life. Listen, when people, I've seen it over and over again, when people who, who love Jesus fall out of love with his word, over time they fall out of love with Jesus. But when the word is opened and it leads us to Jesus and, and Jesus opens up the word, our hearts will burn. So ask yourself, am I, are we, a people of the book? Are we in love with the word? You know, in the Gospel of John, there's this confrontation between Jesus and the religious leaders of his day. These leaders were scripture experts, people of the book. They knew it, they memorized it, they carried it with them everywhere they went. They prided themselves on being scripture experts, but, but that's not enough because we can know the book and still not recognize the word, still not recognize Jesus. And, and so Jesus tells them in John chapter 5, verses 39 through 40, he says, you search the scriptures, that, that's good. You, you search the scriptures because you think they give you eternal life, but the scriptures point to me, and yet you refuse to come to me. See, this is the goal of scripture, that we would draw near to Jesus. And I'm telling you, if we let the word direct us to Christ, we'll find Jesus near and we'll find life given. Hear me one more time in this series. Say, you're not far. I know you may feel like you're far from God, but you're not far. In Luke chapter 24, verses 28 through 32, we see the story again. It says, as they approached the village, the village of Emmaus, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it's nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them, and when he was at the table with them, he took bread and he broke it, and he gave thanks, and he began to give it to them. And, and at that moment, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and then he disappeared from their sight. And they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and he opened the scriptures to us. As they got close to Emmaus, I said this a couple of weeks ago, Jesus acted, he acted like he would keep going. He's not planning on it, he faked it. <laughs> He's not going anywhere. He wasn't gonna walk all that way and teach all that stuff and not let these two know how close he really was, how not far they really were. But he wasn't going to force it either, right? Jesus waits for an invitation. And when invited, he comes in. He, he always comes in when he's invited. But he's not always invited. We have to invite him in. They, they didn't recognize him. They didn't truly experience his presence until they invited him in. But when they invited him in, they recognized him, and then, this is so strange, then, then he disappeared. I don't know about you, but that would have been a mouth-hanging open moment for me. I just would have sat there thinking, oh my God, big G, <laughs> he was here all the time. Someone asked me the question, why do you think he disappeared at that moment? I, I don't know, but maybe, maybe he was preparing them for the days to come when by his unseeable spirit, he would be just as present. Get used to it, he's saying to them. Because right now, he is so here. So I want to challenge you, encourage you, invite Jesus in and soak in the word. And when you do, his presence, it makes our hearts burn. So, so how do we invite him in? You know, if I were to give it a formula, it's a combination of time, surrender, and scripture. Time, surrender, and scripture. I've shared that convicting, at least for me, quote by Leonard Ravenhill about time. He wrote in his book, Why Revival Tarries, I believe the world is going to hellfire because the church has lost its holy ghost fire. It's as simple as that, he wrote. Tell me how much time you spend alone with God and I'll tell you how spiritual you are. Not how many meetings you go to, not how many gifts you have, not how much success you've had. Tell me how much time you spend alone with God and I'll tell you 
how spiritual you are. In other words, I'll tell you how much your heart burns. See, Jesus is not an influencer on TikTok. A few seconds of attention doesn't entice him. That's not the invitation he's seeking. Inviting him will actually take an investment of time, of surrender. He, he doesn't have my heart if he doesn't get my time. We're, we're so distracted. We, we live such distractive lives. There are so many things competing for our time, sports and work and school events and kids' activities and kids' sports and travel and vacations and social media and TV. I, I think Jesus is wooing us. These last two years, maybe at points we thought that he had abandoned us, but, but we just don't see him because we haven't invited him in. His, his arms, I believe, are actually wide open. He's, he's for you. He's not against you. And, and maybe, just maybe, it's time to give him our time. It's time for our hearts to burn. So I, I want to encourage you, give extra time this week to Jesus. Get into Scripture. Read the Word, read, read the Gospels, or, or listen to it. Some of you know that last year I started a podcast called More Than Bread. You can search for it on Spotify or, or Apple. I have, a, I have a link in my D News. I did 40 plus episodes of the New Testament, another 30 plus, I think, doing a deep dive in John's Gospel. And on Monday, the 16th, I'll start downloading the Gospel of Mark. I, I just read Scripture and make a few comments and then read it again. Read Scripture, listen to Scripture. In the coming days, we'll also make available a 21-day blueprint for a burning heart. Just watch for the info. However you do it, in the coming months, give Jesus an extraordinary amount of time. And, and maybe you're asking, well, what is an extraordinary amount of time? Well, I would say it's a bit extra beyond whatever is your ordinary. Whatever is your ordinary, just increase that. If your ordinary is 20 minutes, do 30. If your ordinary is a couple hours, do four. I mean, just, just imagine for a moment. It, it's a few years later after the Emmaus Road, and you become friends with these two Emmaus Road walkers. I mean, you've heard their story more than once, right? You can't be friends with them without hearing that story of the night that they spent with Jesus. But just imagine, well, one night you're together, a small group of you, and you're talking about something you read in the book. And, and one of them just kind of quietly says, you know what, let's just take a moment and, and quiet our hearts and our minds and just be still. And then you kind of hear the other one whisper, Jesus, we invite you in again. And as you talk more about what you've learned and what you're reading, you, you begin to sense his presence. You begin to feel your heart burn. Please let this truth saturate your soul. If you're a Jesus apprentice, you have the Spirit of Christ with you and in you and all around you. You can't see him, but every time you walk into a hard conversation, he's there. When you're with a group who might ridicule your faith, he's there. Every time you don't think you have the energy or the will to do what's right, to be brave, every time you invite him in, he's there. Invite him in. Be an agent of his presence. You bring him with you everywhere you go. Invite him into every moment. Acknowledge his presence. Invite him into your conversations with friends. And don't, don't worry, when he shows up, it will make you more loving, not more judgmental. When we invite him in, every moment becomes a reminder that you're not far. And, and listen to me. So important. Neither are they. They're, they're not far. Your family who's against you, your friends who don't know Jesus, classmates and workmates, your neighbors, even our enemies, listen to me, they're not far. The Spirit has come and resurrection power has been let loose in the world. They aren't nearly as far from Jesus as we've thought. The conclusion of the story of Luke chapter 24 it's found in Luke 24, verses 45 through 49. And, and what it says is, then he opened their minds. This is, this is Jesus with all the disciples, not just the, the two. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. And he told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for, for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations. And you, listen to me. 
You are witnesses of these things, Jesus said. Said to them, he said, says to us, you are witnesses of, the, witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. In other words, if you have invited Jesus in, if your eyes have been opened to recognize Jesus, and Jesus says you are a witness to the resurrection, you are covered with resurrection power, you are not far, and neither are they. Neither are they. Nicole Cliff became a, a Christian on July 7, 2015, after what she called a very pleasant adult life of firm atheism. She felt far. Anybody who knew her would say she's far from God. I mean, the idea of a benign deity who created and loved us, she writes, was obviously nonsense, and all that awaited us beyond the grave was joyful oblivion. I had no untapped, unanswered yearnings. But here's how she describes what happened to her. She says, first, I was worried about my child. And one time I said, please be with me to an empty room. It was embarrassing. I didn't know why I said it or to whom. I brushed it off. She said, I moved on. The situation resolved itself and I didn't think about it again. But do you understand? In that moment, she, she invited him in. Didn't recognize it was Jesus, but she invited him in. Second, she wrote, I, I came across John Orberg's obituary for the philosopher Dallas Willard. John's daughter, she writes, are dear friends, and they've always struck me as sweetly deluded in their faith. But I read the article. Somebody once asked Dallas if he believed in total depravity. I believe in sufficient depravity, he responded immediately. I believe that every human being is sufficiently depraved that when we get to heaven, no one will be able to say, I merited this. A few minutes into reading this obituary, this piece, she burst into tears. Later that day, she burst into tears again. And the next day, brushing her teeth, falling asleep, feeding her kids, didn't matter where she was or what she was doing, she just kept bursting into tears. And as she was led, kind of drawn to read more Christian books, she emailed a Christian friend and asked if she could talk about Jesus. She writes, but an hour before our call, I knew that I believed in God even worse I was a Christian. <laughs> I was crying constantly, she wrote, while thinking about Jesus because I'd begun to believe that Jesus really was Jesus. And, and so when my friend called, I told her kind of awkwardly that I, I wanted a relationship with Jesus. We prayed, she writes. Since then, Nicole says, I've been dunked by a pastor in the ocean while shivering in a too small wetsuit. I've sung, Be Thou My Vision, and celebrated communion on a beach while weirded out Californians tiptoed around me. I go to church, I pray, I still cry a lot, she writes. In fact, I, I read a news article recently that literally sank me to my knees at how broken this world is and yet how stubbornly resilient and joyful we can be in the face of that brokenness. My Christian conversion, she writes, has granted me no simplicity. It's complicated all of my relationships, changed how I feel about money, messed up my reputation, Obviously, it's been very beautiful. What happened to Nicole? She invited Jesus in. Her eyes were opened and her heart began to burn. She said, don't miss this. The, the ultimate purpose of loving our neighbors is that they would have the ultimate privilege of encountering Jesus. And they, need, they need him way more than they need us. In fact, because of Jesus' very real presence with us, Serve Week, those of you who are local, you know all about this. Serve Week is nothing more, nothing less than an opportunity to invite Jesus with us into somebody's yard or house or maybe even life. Introducing our neighbors to Jesus is our ultimate purpose, but it's not our ulterior motive. In other words, if someone doesn't want to know Jesus, we'll still serve them and love them because that's what Jesus would do if he lived in our neighborhood. Man, I'm telling you, if Jesus lived in my neighborhood, I'd be doing everything I could to introduce my neighbors to Jesus, to bring his presence along with me every time I walked into their yard. And, and isn't that what Serve Week and, and Front Yard Missions and CWOW Weekend, Church Without Walls Weekend, isn't that what it's all about? It's no longer enough to invite people to a building on Sunday and hope that they meet Jesus. We want to invite Jesus into our lives so that everywhere we go, there he is. 
You know, we often call these acts of service living proof of a loving God. It's part of how we are witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus. And listen, it's time for our hearts to burn. It's time to walk with people all the way to his presence because you're not far and neither are they. Would you pray with me? Father, I, I just pray for every person listening who, who longs to experience your presence, who, who has at some point in their lives felt their hearts burning for you, with you, and, and now doesn't. God, I, I pray that we would take responsibility for the, the part that we have in that. I, I, I pray that we would be willing to surrender our time and dive into the the word of God, the scripture, that, that we would allow it to, to draw our hearts to you, Jesus, that we would, we would ask you over and over again to come in. We would invite you in and, and ask you to open up our eyes so that we can see the unseen realities that are even more true than what we, what we see. And, and I pray for anybody who, who's never experienced that, who may be like Nicole, you're not even sure that there is a God. Now, I pray that you would lead them to, to a moment of just inviting you in, of taking a chance, of saying the words, Jesus, if you're real, I invite you in. And I pray that, that from that, Jesus, you would begin a relationship with them that will change their lives forever. Father, I, I pray for um, this week coming up and I pray that many would, would seek to be living proof of a loving God, that many would, would go out to serve, and as we serve, that we would bring your presence with us, that it wouldn't just be an act of service, but it would be a, a witness to the resurrection of Christ. We thank you, Jesus, for all that you're doing and all that you're going to do. Thank you that you're not far from us or from our neighbors. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.